Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Philip Johnson. Philip Johnson is recognized by virtually everyone as the Dean of American Architects. His influence began in the 1930s when he was the director of the Museum of Modern Arts Department of Architecture. Since then, his role has been central as master builder, critic, historian, patron, and even gadfly of contemporary architecture. A very warm welcome to you, Philip Johnson. How does it feel to have come from what you yourself have described as the Pex bad boy of architecture to its current most eminent figure? I'd just like you to repeat that uh, introduction again and again. <laughs> I didn't know I was the, uh, such a famous and delightful person. But now that I'm dean, I suppose that means just old, so it's all right. Venerated. Venerated because of old age. And Hardly, about because to of be, accomplishment. Uh, Continuing accomplishment. Well, anyhow, it feels fine. When did you first become a practicing architect, and under what circumstances? Practicing? I practiced architecture long before I was allowed to. Uh, naturally, I couldn't wait for a little thing like a license, because that meant I'd have to go to school and write theses and draw. I can't draw for days. And so I started building buildings. But then eventually you did go to school. Yes, they threw me out of New York. A little Why man you tell came us? around and tapped me <laughs> on the shoulder and said, you're going to have to close this office and leave New York State. Is that so? Did it you indeed. practice without a license? Without practicing without a license. And you went all the way to Cambridge? I went a long way away to New Canaan, Connecticut, where they didn't have any such silly laws, and went right on building until they passed law up there, and then I had to do something. And what did you do? I went to school. That's the hardest thing. Don't ever do that if you don't have to. You don't have to, no. Because I could use it, it. it hurts very much to go to school after, after 30. I was 34, and the kids uh, around me, my classmates, looked to me all 15. I suppose they were a little older. <laughs> Who were your teachers? A lot of kids younger than I, uh, and some people my own age. Uh, uh, Mr. Breuer was the leader. He was the best teacher I ever had, and he was a couple of years older. And who was the then dean of the school? Dean was Dean Hudnut from Columbia, but the leading man, of course, was Walter Gropius, the leading spirit of the Bauhaus and a uh, very strict uh, creator, or one of the creators of the international stock. Well, to whose work did you especially respond then? By whom were you most influenced? Well, I disliked Mr. Gropius so much that I had uh, no trouble getting uh, impetus from other places. Man influenced me most, but didn't live there at all. It was Mies van der Rohe, my guru, who was the head of the school in uh, Chicago. And him I saw all the time. And, uh, but in the school, it was uh, only Mr. Breyer. Your early influence was as a teacher and a curator. We talked about that briefly. You said your first show, I think you were referring then to your first show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1932. That's that right. together with Henry Russell Hitchcock, you curated a show entitled The International Style. That's right. Where did you ever get that idea? Well, it's a perfectly natural one. That uh, the, We can't go into the whole history of it uh, tonight, but the, uh, the international style was a very uh, severe, uh, definite movement, such as we haven't seen since the uh, Gothic. That is, it was a universally accepted, uh, and if you stepped out of it, you stepped out of it at your peril. Uh, I remember this uh, building that we're in was uh, castigated by not being pure enough international style, by, uh, my, by me actually. Uh, but the, all the buildings that later on became the buildings that we see all around us are all international style. And so the name stuck because it was true. I mean, it was a discipline of architecture that avoided ornament that had flat roofs, that had lots of glass and ribbons of glass and stucco or plain materials and uh, no uh, capitals and nat naturally no orders. And uh, the Beaux-Arts was uh, castigated and we thought we'd save the world. It was a, a, almost a moral movement. So in addition to being a discipline of architecture, there was a very profound philosophy where you really believe that architecture would make a difference. We did did believe it. Corbusier once said people will be better people if they live behind glass. That's of course today an absurdity. We, we don't want glass around. But I mean uh, in the 20s when the international style really did its greatest work in Europe, not here, 
uh, the, uh, the rules were very strict and the hopes for the future were endless. It was the, uh, the old socialist dream of everybody was going to be happy. Now we know that perhaps maybe none of us are going to be happy and uh, uh, I would rather welcome that. We don't have these illusions anymore. Well, what has replaced the illusions? A perfectly delightful sense of living in a real world. You, uh, we were talking about your role as a teacher and as a curator. I suspect you really enjoyed those roles, and sometimes I think that you never really abandoned them. Oh no, I'm still doing it. I still tell everybody what to do. Uh, just ask me, and I'm still uh, completely cantankerous. And I have my favorites, very strong ones, and I'm, uh, I guess, the most hated architect in America. Uh, which is a perfectly normal uh, reaction against anybody that's too outspoken. Did you ever consider the possibility that you might be the most admired architect in America? Oh, I know, that I know I'm not, so that's all right. Uh, the most, well, that's not even name names for that. Well, I think as, as this evolves, if one ever determines such a thing, I guess it must be by the estimation of one's peers. And there, I guess now three or four years ago, there was a prize given in architecture that was the most distinguished prize oh, ever that's given. Right. That's right. And do you know who the very first recipient of that prize was? I remember I was. Yes. Very proud of it, the Pritzker Award, which is the Nobel Prize of Architecture. Uh, Kevin Roach won it this year. And uh, it is indeed a great honor, and I am sensible of that. Most architects today reject Mies van der Rohe's austerity but they seem to rejoice in the underlying classicism of his work. What do you see as his most lasting contribution to architecture? And to what me, is it? the most underlying quality of his was his classicism. Naturally, we see that a lot more now that we're all classicists, but uh, we slice the butter differently every time. And right now, it's sliced that way. We don't consider him a uh, austere, uh, monotonous man. We consider him a reductionist classicist, a contaminated classicist. A, class a that's contaminated a, a good, classicist? That's a marvelous new word. You'll it get is. it with some of the later people you're going to talk with. Uh, Tell us, please, what that well, means. Well, that's our present uh, philosophy. Mine, anyhow. At least I accept it because it was invented by somebody else. It was Peter Eisenman, actually. And uh, contaminated classicism is what Mies did. I mean, uh, the Seagram building is a, a strictly organized, uh, hierarchically classical uh, as, as any uh, palace in the 18th century, you see. And his very careful balancing of symmetrical parts was almost uh, thrown out of the canon of the international style because it was too symmetrical. You see, our sense of balance in the uh, international style came from Mondrian and the Cubist. Uh, space, spatial lapping, whereas Mises came from Schinkel, the great uh, Prussian classicist, and uh, from his own uh, historic sense. Mises was an historian. He and I always uh, spent our, whenever we had vacations or time, lo looking at classical architecture. He never bothered with modern. See, so now we see him as the leader of the uh, almost anti-modern proto-classical uh, revolution. Some What's, of us. What is most important to you about his work? That is his, was his sense of, of organization, of order, of clarity, of his uh, sense of detail. As he said, God lies in the details. I still believe that. A lot of architects just say the idea is the thing. If you have an idea, that'll carry it. It won't. It's the detail that carries the building. And he taught that. And it shows in the, in the Seagram building, which I watched him design. I was listed as a co-designer. That isn't fair. He did it. And the, all the little, the little parts. So it's fun next time you go by is to look at the way the little mullion, you know, the thing that mm -hmm. holds the windows apart. Just see how that's, you know, if you look up carefully enough, you'll see how that is sculpted. That was hand sculpted by Mies van der Rohe himself, the shape of that, of that thing. It's not simple. It looks simple doesn't look so simple. I notice that you do not take credit as being co-designer of the building, no. but you do list yourself as the designer of the Four Seasons That's, restaurant. I did that, yes. He'd left, he was tired. He said, why should I design uh, restaurants? I couldn't agree with him more, but uh, he was older than I and I didn't know enough uh, not to, to leave restaurants strictly alone. Just don't design restaurants. <laughs> it's too hard. 
and uh, I spent a long time doing that. Well, it's obviously a place and a space that you enjoy enormously. It's yeah. your lunchtime club. Yes, I have a stamtisch there, and I always eat there. The food's good. Very How simple. does the room hold up for you after all these years? I still like it. I wouldn't do it that way. It, it's too uh, barren and too, um, uh, too square, too cubic. But uh, we used enough rich materials. That's another thing Mies differed from the other international style. He wasn't afraid of, uh, of using rich materials. Why don't we talk for a moment about the level of design and dialogue that exists today. Do you find it more impressive now than it was at the time that you brought your now legendary international style show to the Museum of Modern Art? I don't think there's any question. In, in our day, uh, there was nobody around that talked about architecture. Um, in our first show, we weren't reviewed in any magazines. And no newspapers would touch us. And there was no discussion, set, and there was no shows like this one. Nobody liked Barbara Lee Diamondstein to keep us in the straight and narrow. How do you think that the public feels about the built environment today? I think they hate it cordially. Uh, Do you think they notice? Uh, yes, uh, some subconsciously, but most of them consciously. At least uh, my mail and the people that call uh, find enough to scream about, uh, especially when I build something they resent. I notice they notice those much more than what they might like. Well, then you're saying that the public really cares. It's changing. I think, for instance, uh, the example of that is what's happened in the preservation movement. Uh, there was no preservation movement in my day. I marched with six people to try to save the Pennsylvania Station. That was only 20 years ago. And uh, now think what would happen if anybody dared touch the Pennsylvania Station. I mean, it'd be worse than, than the uh, Grand Central today. You're noted as a kind of patron of younger architects. You send work their way and you follow their careers closely. And by your own admission, you have your own favorites. Oh, yes. And you seem to be interviewing most of them, so I can't talk about them. It's too bad, <laughs> because it would be fun to say mean things. But uh, it's impossible since I picked them all. And Who are some of those favorites? Well, Venturi it seems to me the most important uh, architect uh, in the world today. Uh, you notice I use the word important. I don't, I don't care so much for his uh, work as I do for his thinking. But he revolutionized uh, architecture with this book in 1960. Complexity and Contradiction. That's right. It's a very, very uh, seminal uh, book for all of us, architect, old and young. And it freed us. It's like uh, untying all the chains. With, with one great stroke. And another favorite of mine is, uh, of course, Graves, who's uh, also a classicist, if you will, Michael Graves. Well, uh, we know that you were helpful in getting Michael Graves the commission to do the new Portland Municipal Building in Oregon. Yes, Something I'm that I'm building, trouble. I guess, that is almost as controversial as your own AT&T building. What do you think of the Portland Municipal Building now that it is I, th I think he was up against it. It signals the first public building in the uh, after modern period, after international style period. And it's a very, very important building. But uh, he didn't have a chance. And Why? Because the was building it the architectural community the, as no. well as the other community oh, that no. was opposed to it? Oh, not at all. Everybody was opposed to it except me. But the point is that the, that the program he was given was a squat cubic building with much too much in it that wouldn't go and a price that you couldn't build a building for. And he had to sign up that the building would be built for this much so there was no chance of using any decent materials. There was no chance of making a decent shaped building. And everything was jammed in that possibly could. And, uh, of course, that's how we won the prize, because he was the cheapest. And in the end, how do you think it all turned out? Pretty well. In the light of those limitations? Yes. But I want people to realize that when they see it, that they're, they're only, it's, it's almost better, more fair to him to look at his sketches. But that's all right. He's building lots of buildings. He'll be, in the next five years, he'll be the leading architect, I think. There are some other younger architects that are your favorites. Tell us, if you will, what makes each of them important depends and what you feel you, as an accomplished architect, can learn from mm -hmm. them. Depends upon who's looking at this broadcast. Um, there are a lot of them. For instance, uh, Richard Meyer is entirely different. But I like his work just as much. I mean, the whole, uh, the whole range of architecture from Frank Gehry, another favorite of mine. 
or um, Robertson Eisenman, or I mean, there's a whole slew. And the slew that you're describing have very diverse work. Very so there must work. be something that's, 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 that each of them that engages you. Is it the idea? Is it the detail? That's the what? No. Is it the a, aspiration? No, certainly not the aspiration. It's the accomplishment. And uh, it's the shapes that they are able to make. You only judge, how do you judge any work of art? What, uh, why, is, why is Mondrian better than anybody that copied him? Because somehow he had a way with the thickness of a line versus a square of white and a square of red uh, that was balanced correctly to the eye. Now there's absolutely no words that can tell you why Mondrian is better than um, Diller or any of the other types. But uh, he is, and is recognized as such, and is paid for as such. The marketplace is not such a bad place after all, you see. Now these people that I mentioned are not all appreciated, but I think they will be. I'm hoping we're, we're setting up uh, better standards, and we are. I mean, this, we, this conversation, conversation couldn't be held uh, 10 years ago. There wasn't, there wasn't five or six architects to pick among that generation. What? And there weren't so many wonderful How directions. How do you explain the difference? Well, the freedom that, uh, that Venturi gave us. You see that now it's no a crime to copy Corbusier. It's no crime to enjoy looking at Schinkel. Uh, even in, in Pittsburgh, at least, it's not a particular crime to build a Gothic uh, skyscraper. Which you have done, and we'll talk we about it done. a little Whenever bit. Whenever you're ready. What but, was your own <laughs> first architectural endeavor? And who was your patron? Oh, for oneself, of course. You always have to build for Aunt Matilda if you're lucky enough to have to a rich. To have an Aunt Matilda. Rich Aunt Matilda. The first rule of architecture is to be born rich. The second rule is to, failing that, to marry wealthy. Uh, and, and the third is to, there's name third. You've got to do one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it, it's one of those very difficult professions. And I started a building, of course, for my family. I built a barn out in the country out in London, Ohio, where we had a farm. And you can always build farm buildings just to store machinery in, if nothing else. It's a very handsome, classical building. And then one of your very first buildings was a building for yourself just about 40 years ago, a house that you did in Connecticut. Oh, that's right. I'd forgotten that. Maybe that was the first. 1942. That's right. That's right. And I went straight from that house. I finished it and went off to the war. So I didn't live in it very long. Well, what if an architect doesn't have the luxury of commissioning oneself? Well, then he has to be very bright. Like and very I patient. Pay or very patient. Or a genius. Frank Lloyd Wright. We don't have that type of genius anymore. We're not in that kind of a period. We're not in what the English call an heroic period. There's no uh, great uh, Corbusier, Mies, and Wright. Nobody would dispute that. See, and nobody disputed it at that time, in the, in the 30s and, and 20s. I mean, we granted these people their genius status as you would Michelangelo and Brunelleschi. Today, I don't think any of us um, uh, range up to that scale. Do you see any incipient architects? Well, I think uh, well, I would name among these uh, children that I talk about, children, they're f over 50 now, uh, uh, as any of them potentials. But I don't see them yet. I don't think any of them think of themselves that way. You see, Mies was convinced that he was the greatest architect in the world when he was young. And Frank Lloyd Wright never got over the fact that there were only two architects ever that ever lived, Michelangelo and himself, which he wasn't at all hesitant to tell you. And you did not hesitate to tell him at one point in his and your career. Yeah, I know. That was embarrassing. Yeah. Can you I tell us about that? Yes, I told him he was the greatest architect of the 19th century, and this was way into the 20th when I said that. <laughs> that was uh, very unfair, and he did a lot of his best work after that. But you see, don't worry, I, I told you before, the international style was a moral fervor movement as well as just an intellectual one. And uh, Wright didn't fit. And that was, we were very mean to him. Apologize, Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> About six and s or seven years after you designed the house in Connecticut, you designed a now famous house for yourself in Connecticut as well, and that was about 1948 and nine, the Glass House. Glass House, uh, that's right. How does that look to you today? Well, it's marvelous. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, but I wouldn't build like it. You would not build that again? No. Oh, no, it isn't interesting enough. 
You see, uh, our sense of what's interesting is influenced again by Venturi. Uh, but uh, it's too simple-minded. You take the biggest piece of glass you can buy. And, uh, and then I, we, I spent all my time, is how do you hold up glass? Do you hold it up with a piece that yay by that yay, or that yay by that yay, you see? And uh, that took uh, months, years, of how to do every one of those little details. I mean, there wasn't any uh, broad brush, uh, interesting shapes like this room, for instance, that we, could, uh, that we could refer to in those days. It was also strict. What was the most Desicated. important aspect of that design for you at the time that you were creating it? Were there any elements that are more significant than others? Yes, the sighting. I think if you have a glass box uh, without any character, I mean, without any uh, interesting details that you would enjoy wandering in among that it better, it damn well better look well placed. And so I found the most glorious site, Connecticut's full of them. And uh, that I've never tired of. Every time I get an idea, I build it on myself, you see, because there's only one good client in the end, and that's oneself. Because you don't have anybody bothering you about the budget or, or telling you that that, that your closet isn't big enough. That's the worst thing you can hear from a client, you see, because how are you going to put add to the closet? You can't stick it out a little further if you have a, a no, nothing to balance it on the other side. It's impossible to build for clients. Many people, I guess, are under the impression that an architect comes up with an idea, works long hours to execute the design, and then presto, it gets built. How do you take an idea, and no matter how good that idea, Unless you're a Philip Johnson, an I.M. Pei, a Kevin Roche, how do you take that idea and translate it into a reality? It's like porcupine making love, difficulty. It's uh, an idea uh, just occurs to one. There's no, uh, there's no way you can work at it. And then the rest of the time is just plain uh, sweat. It's hard work. There's no rule. There's no way you can become a good architect. Certainly not going to school. We, we should. You see, we're apprentice. such a rich country that we can afford to waste five years of kids' times uh, at public expense to train them to be architects. And of course, it's all a waste of time. I mean, uh, well, none what is of the, the great architects. Well, what do the great architects do? They just hung out their shingle or they just went to work for another architect. Frank Lloyd Wright never went to school. Frank Mies van der Rohe never went to school. Le Corbusier never went to school. But when you didn't go to school, you were in this... I was disbarred and thrown out of the state. Yes, well, things change. You have to, be, you have, to have a license now to be a barber. You have to be licensed to be an elevator operator. Don't you think that's a pretty good idea? No, I Does that help don't. establish standards or dilute them in I the end? I certainly don't think it makes any difference at all when you have those pieces of paper. I think which where you learn is after you get out of school, where you learn the school of hard knocks, you learn by thinking of a conception and then trying to see if it'll be built. And then you, you work on the engineering side, and then you work on the history side. I mean, for instance, I'm a great histori histori history lover. I didn't ever learn history. I never had a course in history. I just, you know, just picked it up through the, through the pores of your skin is where you learn. What artist ever went to school? If they did, they, they were probably ruined. I mean, uh, Jasper Johns never went to school. Uh, Matisse. How ridiculous. Picasso? Heavens, he started to paint great pictures when he was eight and ten years old. Mozart? But his father was a great teacher of art, so that there was something in that environment that from the very beginning he I knew was I'd exposed pick the wrong to. One. <laughs> All right, let's stick to. Let's stick to Mozart. I don't, well, he had a father, too. And that is genetically transmitted. <laughs> yeah, that's a, when you, we were talking a moment ago, you made reference to this space. And I could not help but think that a concern of every architect is the initial perception of a space, if it is a room or a building. And I wondered if you would tell us what you think about when you plan that important or influential entrance to anything it is that you design and how your concerns are different in the design of a building and that of a room. A room is the opposite of a building. There's, we, we always talk in our office of our inside buildings and our outside buildings. What does that mean? Well, uh, it, some of our buildings are very successful outside without any interiors. And some of our buildings are great rooms. But uh, we just let the outside sort of be, get tacked onto the great room. The great trick in architecture, I don't think I've ever totally succeeded, is the combination. But you take something like the Parthenon, that's an outside building. It hasn't any inside. 
you never went inside. On the other hand, you take uh, some of the cathedrals in the Middle Ages. Uh, I think one there isn't any exterior. A lot of the English ones are no, no exteriors at all. It's really that incredible Gothic space. But don't forget in the Middle Ages, the outside of, the, of them were covered with houses that, that were glued to them. And that wasn't the point. The point was the great room, the Pantheon has no outside today. Which of your buildings do you think comes closest to combining the outside and inside? I don't know. I wouldn't, I'd be um, amiss to say, because you see skyscrapers, which has been most of my work in the last 10 years, uh, 15 years, have, uh, don't have interiors. You can't make architecture out of an elevator. Except you have managed to do that in one of your most uh, currently celebrated and controversial buildings, and I'm thinking of the new AT&T building, where, as I recall, yes, not only the monumental entrance, mm. but the lower space doesn't even have a lobby. Mm. Why did you choose to do that? That may have an interior. Have you looked into that door? I you have. Can, you can see them <laughs> at, at night there where they leave the work lights on. Yes. That's going to be a great, yeah, but you haven't seen the vaulting on it. But That's I've going seen to have a gold leaf cross vaulted ceiling on it. I've seen a photograph that reveals the old statue yes. uh, atop the Golden old AT&T mm -hmm. uh, building that will be right underneath that. Right underneath the gold vault, yes, will be the, the old statue from downtown. And it'll stand there and be symbolic of the biggest company in the world for quite a while. Why don't you tell us for a moment, did you ever expect the public to receive that building the way they did when it was announced no. several years ago? No, I thought it was perfectly natural. We were given the job of doing the um, Seagram building of the 80s. And uh, since I'd worked on the Seagram building 20 years before, we seemed like logical choice for them. And we promised them that. We said, we're going to get you the most important building in the city of New York, which is only your due as the biggest company in the world. And so we designed it, they loved it. And we started the building, all of a sudden hell breaks loose. A. Louise hates it. If A. Louise hates the building, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> Simple. Fortunately, Mr. Goldberg likes it. But you yourself have referred to as the high boy pediment. No, I have not. I resent that very, very much. It has nothing to do with the high boys. And I resent the fact that we thought we were building a small building and blowing it up in scale. That is a, a, a hoary old uh, tradition in classical architecture to break a pediment. And there are many, many ways of breaking it. And, and all through the Hellenistic age and the Baroque age, pediments were broken, twisted, bent, uh, curved, tipped. And uh, th this was our way of doing it. We put that top on that building uh, so it would uh, call attention to the building and identify it. All the buildings in New York, if you look down from Empire State, are Ill illegible. I mean, they're just flat uh, things covered with, uh, with uh, uh, under them is more uh, uh, equipment. Our building, you're going to recognize the way you do the great buildings in New York, the Chrysler Building and the General Electric Building and uh, it's all the downtown buildings that are built with, with uh, beautiful tops on them or points on the Woolworth Tower. All buildings that are of the great period, which is the 90s and in the 20s, have tops on them. And we said, we're going to give you a top. And that, of course, was where we had problems also, even with our clients. Why don't we talk about something that you have done in that building um, that is either a very fresh or a revisionist idea, and that is, instead of overhead fluorescent lighting, you plan to rely on incandescent desk lamps. Remember desk lamps? Oh, barely. How and in response to what issues did you decide to do that? The hominess, uh, the uh, office glare of fluorescent light ceilings, <clears throat> the bad color of fluorescent tubes, the uh, uh, the boredom with office world and if you go in and you pull a little chain and, and if it's too much light you push the lamp away there's not enough you bring it a little closer that's what you do the minute you get home from the office anyhow if you're taking notes you want them on the other side you're a lefty so you put the, the lamp on the other side it's uh, the original way of doing it what other innovations have you developed in response to constraints be they financial or technological? Oh, well, the best thing is getting rid of the elevators. 
see. Well, then how do you get up, up, and away in that oh, well, skyscraper? Well, but there are only four. You see, there's some 34 or five elevators in the building. But with only four, we didn't have to make a big lobby. We just had that one great room. And then at the end of that great room are the four doors, you know, the four uh, shuttle cars, we call them, that go up to the real lobby, which is up on top of that great big arch. That's why that great big arch is such a great big arch. Because when you get up to the real lobby, you're still under the arch itself. What particularly informed your sensibility in the construction of that monumental? The public. We had a too big a building in too tight a site. There's no question about that. I still resent the fact that they didn't buy the land that the IBM is built on, but they didn't. They couldn't. IBM wouldn't sell it. And uh, so we had to take a second place and we jammed our building up with everybody else. So we said the best way then is to give the, as much of this ground back to the public as we can. So we took the elevators, which practically take up the whole building, see, in a small building like that, and just lifted them up. You've built a number of buildings. One of the most famous buildings visually that transform the skyline of Houston. I'm thinking of Pennzoil. Oh, Pennzoil, yes. And yes. that sort of split yeah, this, appearance. Yeah. And currently, you have a commission there that will be the tallest building in Houston's Galleria, the Transco building. And that building will dominate the city all over again in some ways, like the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Will you tell us something about that design and how that evolved? That's a delightful story. The, this um, Jerry Hines, the developer, wanted to really make his mark in his uh, development part that he did in near the uh, near uh, Tex, near Houston. And if you take a skyscraper and put it in New York, you hardly see it. But if you take a 65-story building and put it out in the country, yeah, that's what gives it the Eiffel Tower effect, and that's what we've done. All the rest of the buildings are 10 stories; you don't see them. And, uh, and so this great big thing sticks up there and it's a lot of fun. Was he the patron of the Pennzoil building as yes, well? Yes, he was the um, instigator of that and it gave him such a kick he thought he'd do it again. And much more important perhaps is the Republic Bank building, which is Gothic. How important is a patron to an architect? And who was the best patron you ever had? Jerry Hines. Should I say that with all my new clients around? But they have he, something to aspire to now. Yes, that everybody says, how did Jerry do it? How did he do it? Smart, smart. But uh, patrons are more than half, I would say. You cannot, architecture is much too important to uh, leave to the architects. Because you see, we uh, get fantastic and we get silly ideas and, and uh, we aren't willing as, as artists to tear up our work. And uh, so we build it, and that's a mistake. Then you have to cover it with ivy or move to another city or something awful. But uh, if you have a patron, you see, he'll stop you short and say, we can't afford that, and you'll say, then you go home and, and cry. But I've heard you describe architects as the employees of the developers. That, I did not think, was a very flattering kind of relationship. And perhaps you would tell us where you well, see I, that a more, going. A more flattering one may be horror, but... Uh, I don't think that's a very nice word either, but we are. And uh, employees, um, it would be, I wish we were, because we don't get paid as well as uh, most employees. Because they know they can uh, get architectural work uh, quite cheaply. Because we're so dying to build it, we, could, we would do it for nothing if we, could, if we could eat. And they don't like to have a starve to death, so as an employee, we're, we're on the, one of the lower echelons. You've said, however, that there are commissions that an architect can and should refuse. Yes, I refuse St. Bart's, but anybody Why did would. you choose to do that? Because I didn't want to hurt uh, good use, great building. To me, uh, great architecture is something that has to be preserved at all costs, and this didn't seem to be much cost. They're very rich people that own that church, and uh, they owe it to New York to uh, keep it a, uh, for two reasons, an open space, and a, uh, I think good use of very great architect is a little unrecognized now, but you wait five years. And uh, I wouldn't uh, overshadow it or tear part of it down. I refused, oh, still more important job, uh, the, uh, the tower, which didn't get done anyhow, the tower over the Grand Central. That was my first statement of principle, because that would have hurt the Grand Central Station. 
you've said that you do not know of any great period in architecture that paid no attention to details. And earlier you said you still believe that God was in the details. To what details should the architect be most attentive today? Uh, that changes with the, um, with the period. In the United, international style, the detail was how do you go around a window frame? Do you go around evenly or do you just buy one off the shelf uh, where the companies do the detailing and it's all awkward, the width and everything. And the detail that Mies van der Rohe paid most attention to were the frames of the windows and the frames of the spandrels and the frames of the doors and the corners. Mies was a bear on corners, which of course he learned from Schinkel. And, uh, and Corbucci had a different set. Uh, but today, uh, I don't worry about windows details so much. I worry much more about the, uh, well, my latest building, I'm worrying about uh, the relation of a circle and a, and, a, and a cylinder and a rectangular thing. When, when you bump two shapes in, what happens when one is taller than the other? It leaves a scar up in the sky in the round building. See, that's the kind of thing. And how have you resolved that? I leave the scar and make it a different material. The scar above the building that I cut off is uh, mirror glass. It's a mirror glass slice in a granite building. It's a new attempt at skyscraper design. It's a, I'm very proud of it. It's a village concept. That is, there's six buildings, all different heights, and the two kinds, round ones and rectangular ones. And they bump together making only two buildings with a garden in between. See, they go around the edge of the site. In Boston, the sites aren't like New York, downtown. It's a medieval pattern, just like that. So we just followed them around with these six buildings all bumping each other. Isn't that fun? Sounds the good. tallest is the tallest building in, in Boston, as tall as, uh, I think it's as tall as uh, that famous glass one. Hancock. Hancock. But uh, the rest are, are shorter, but they all, the lower one leaves a mark in the, in the taller one. Who has commissioned that uh, village? An incredible developer. From Boston? Uh, no, from Pittsburgh. The Hillman Company. In fact, in Pittsburgh, you are building a structure that is in some ways much like ATT in New York in its proportion, its scale, and its use of materials. Can you describe that uh, building? You mean the PPG building? Mm -hmm. Well, this is about the opposite of uh, of uh, AT&T. AT&T is, is a classical building and it is uh, built of granite with little windows in it. PPG is all built of glass, as you can imagine why. It's the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company. Mm -hmm. So the entire building is, uh, is glass, but the details uh, are uh, gothic. I mean, it has little, little spires on it. Oh, delicious. Little four-corner spires. This has peaks like um, Pugin's uh, uh, House of Parliament, you know, or, or any, any English church. You've designed buildings in glass before. In fact, one of them is longer and wider and higher than Notre Dame. It's the world's first drive-in church oh. that you did in Garden Grove, California, in a building that is called the Crystal Cathedral. The request of the Reverend Dr. Robert Schuler to you was to tie the religious experience to nature. How did you manage to do that? Uh, over um, protests, uh, we designed a perfectly uh, sensible church. Yes. You know, with a nice roof and solid walls with a nice mysterious feeling where you feel, I'm now in a church. I, I'm feeling good. And when he said, I want it all glass, I said, Dr. Schuler, you certainly don't want to sit here and look at all the parked cars because he had to have an opening to, to, to address the people sitting in their cars. And uh, he said, yes, what is wrong with cars? You live in your car all day long. Are you ashamed of it? Is God not in the car? You see? And uh, it's an entirely way, a different way of looking at religion from the way I look at it in the Gothic cathedral. Well, how do you think of this type of building as a place of worship as contrasted to more traditional forms? Well, I'm surprised. It works marvelously. It's a very religious uh, light yeah, because we used a very almost opaque glass. Uh, it's all uh, like working underwater. You've been underwater long enough to know that lovely feeling, you know, not the type. I'm not keen on that. Oh, well, go snorkeling sometime. Oh, I've done that. Oh, well, you know that beautiful light. Yes. That's the light in this church, you see. And then it's covered with Is that something that you do? Snorkel? Oh, no, I've never been underwater. Have so then how did you manage to create that? 
Well, I said to myself, it must look like this underwater. <laughs> and judging by Cousteau's pictures, it does look like that. You have to use your imagination a little bit. No, I wouldn't ever go near water. Uh, uh, but what this does, you see, is to sparkle with these little white uh, lines. They aren't little, they're great big things, but there's so many of them. And they're so far away that they look very, very, very small. And you look off into one of those corners, and it's, uh, it's a long way away. So, and it, it does work religiously. Do you ever set out to design a building in a particular style? Yes, I designed the Miami group, uh, a civic group, which, is, which will open next spring. This is the Dade County, Cultural, Dade County Cultural, Center. Cultural Center in Miami, and that is right in the middle of the city. And we decided to build a little Acropolis a square. Heavily a influenced square. by the Hispanic? Heavily influenced. Heck, it is. Well, it's not Spanish as much as it is Tuscan, I guess. But you get enough pictures of enough, enough Tuscan um, farmhouses and put enough arches in so it looks like a Decarico, they tell me. And I don't know, maybe, I hope it does. Decarico is a, is a much maligned, a much undervalued influence on architects. He had more influence on architects than Picasso did. See, but it isn't counted, but it should be. Anyhow, this looks like... Do you like think that recent exhibition of his and that institution with which you've been involved for more than so 50 many years, years yes. um, will change that perception? Uh, the uh, No, I don't think so. I think architects will go wherever they want. And I think a lot more of them go to Kiriko than admit it. So much of your life has been involved with the visual arts and the design of museums as well. I wonder uh, if you would talk for a moment about one of your generous acts, and that is as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Museum of Modern Art. You served on the architecture committee that commissioned another architect to design the new museum tower. And in addition to approving the work of another ar architect, you sacrificed a building that you had co-designed in an earlier period. Well, that sounds like such a good story. Well, it's true. Mm. How do you feel about that building now that it's nearing completion? Well, it's very nice. I'm going to live there. Are you going to move to that building? Yes, because I can see several other buildings I like to look at. Like AT&T? Like AT&T. <laughs> it's right on your horizon. So, no, I can see the garden right at the garden. Which is of your design. Best New York. Yeah, which I designed. I can see the Seagram building I had something to do with. And then the AT&T stands right in front of me. So I decided that was a good place to live. No, I didn't. I got fired. That's why I didn't build that building. I wanted to build it. How did you get fired? That's very difficult. But I managed. How did you do that? I don't know. Well, Weren't you the likely choice? I thought so. <laughs> well, they said they wanted to go out. I don't blame them. They wanted to go outside the board of trustees, get a, uh, an objective. There were several other architects on the board. Of, there are yes, several other architects. There are still several other architects on the board. No, uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun, working in the museum all those years. But, of course, I miss Alfred Barr so much, who started me off in life, that uh, it's all different now. How important, in fact, is, has your involvement with artists been during the course of your own career, not only for your pleasure, but your work as an architect? That's a very good question. I don't learn anything from the young, arch from the young artists. Uh, we're just friends because I collect their work. I like to look at them on the wall. Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't learn from them. I think mostly I learn from Mondrian and Kiriko. Do you learn from younger architects? Oh, yes. Um, I learned especially even from Venturi, from Meyer, from Stern, from Graves, uh, from uh, Eisenman. Recently you've changed your relationship to your firm, Johnson Berge, and you have become a consultant. When one hears and reads about all of the assignments and commissions that you're involved in, I begin to wonder if there's really a difference in role or merely in title. I think you're mean. I say it's just a change in title. My partner says that eventually, and indeed true eventually, it'll be in fact. But uh, nothing has changed. But he's got to get you a do chance. That? I did it to help him. There's no point at all in a middle-aged man that does half the work always calling it Johnson's AT&T building. Johnson's Transco building, it just isn't fair. I couldn't get the jobs, I couldn't carry them out, I couldn't design them without sitting down with him on every single detail. And I'm well known and John Bergie isn't. 
So now John Brigui um, is beginning to get some bylines without my name on it, you see, which is good because then in a few years, we not specify when, uh, uh -huh. he'll have his starting line. I think every older architect should do that. What do you think of as your greatest contribution? Is it a particular building, or an idea, or a theory, or maybe even well, an attitude? It infuriates me to believe it, but probably my influence is that I talk so much, and that uh, I favor the young, and that and naturally they reciprocate by thinking I must be good, or I wouldn't favor them, see? So I get from these uh, five or six architects that I like, a lot of uh, mutual admiration society uh, deals. So if they're going to be good architects, then my reputation is perfectly safe because that'll mean good architects will say I'm good. And here I am, most desirous in this world of being known as a great architect. And instead, I'm going to be known as the great influence of the 80s or 70s uh, in, in helping a whole slew of architects. Well, what what would you like to best be known for? For my buildings, naturally. And are there any that you would cite especially? Well, the glass house, I guess I can't help being known for. And now it's always the next one, Boston. Or um, even uh, what's coming up in Times Square. What is coming up in Times Square? Can you tell us briefly? Uh, Times Square is in a very bad shape. Uh, what we're doing uh, is building four uh, buildings, more or less the same, like, sort of a Rockefeller Center uh, for that part of town, only somewhat larger. Uh, some four million square feet uh, we're putting up there, in, um, and that should be a new center for New York. If you had unlimited time and funds and assistance, on what would you focus? Is there a particular building that you haven't built yet, either a building type Yes, there's a building type location? that I hope to get the job of. It's an architectural school. So I sat right down and designed it. And I guess we aren't going to have it, but I mean, something like that. I'd like to do a museum. They haven't asked me to do a museum for 20 years. Everybody else is building museums, but it's I'm true. Not. Are there any more museums that are unbuilt? It seems to be every day. Look at Myers. Everybody's building one. I'd like to do a house. Really? Well, I wouldn't have time, but I mean, I would like to. Would you do it if asked? Uh, it would have to be in the range of eight to ten million dollars. A little house. Be, that would be quite small. If you had it to do over again, what would you do otherwise? <laughs> I'd do exactly the same thing. I wouldn't be such an ass as I was in my youth and run off to Huey Long and, and I'd become a farmer. I did that for a while. I was a lousy farmer and a lousy politician. Just unbelievably bad. I couldn't make a public speech and Huey Long was crazy. And, uh, and so I wasted a lot of years I could have been designing. So when I got to Harvard when I was old, I said to Breuer, I'm not so sure I can go to Harvard. And he said, what's the matter? Let me look at your hands. Well, they aren't very pretty, but they, they, he said, you seem to have the right number of fingers. You can be an architect. And not only that, you see, but I was so much older than the rest of the class that I had more fun. So I can advise everybody that's thinking of going to become an architect to start before they're 40. You've said that both historians and architects make very bad profits. But if there was a prophecy you'd care or dare to make, what would that be? That would be that we are entering a unbelievably glorious age of melange, of uh, eclecticism, of uh, random uh, choices and leaderships that's impossible to pin down, but that should be the greatest period architecture has ever seen. And you have helped to make it so. I blasted a few things loose, yes. Thank you, Philip Johnson, for being with us tonight. And thank you, audience, too. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you very wonderful. much. You're a wonderful, wonderful interviewer. You're a wonderful yeah. interviewee. And now what we like to do is to have the audience join in the conversation. If you notice, 